the issue there comes down to size, type, and location. So those three things about the mine make it incompatible with the fishery. So it's it's absolutely massive. It's a type of mining that's known to harm the fishery. And it's in the location at the headwaters of two of the most important rivers that if there was a spill or accident would likely cause both of those cause harm to both of those river systems. And because of that would just decimate a lot of the fish-based industry um, in the region. That was Jenny Weiss describing the potential impacts from a pebble mine. Yep, we are still talking about pebble. This is the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, episode 128. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. If you've been enjoying the podcast and want to support the show, head over to wetflyswing.com slash members and sign up for our member society. We have a new live event that might be coming to your neck of the woods soon. Signing up for the member society will uh, be a vote for you to maybe take the show uh, close to your hometown. If you want to hear more, head over to whatflyswing.com slash members to support the show and your journey. In today's episode, we hear from Jenny Weiss, who has been trying to protect Bristol Bay and gives an update on the Pebble Mine Madness. Find out why we are talking about Pebble again, what you can do to help um, uh, protect it, and why copper in your device right now is what they are digging for. 56 million reasons to listen to this episode today and have an impact. 56 million. Let that sink in for a second. So, without further ado, here's Jenny Weiss from Trout Unlimited. How's it going, Jenny? Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for making the time to come on. I'm sure in a, a busy schedule. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Bristol Bay specifically. I want to dig into uh, the pebble. Uh, uh, I guess <laughs> I guess you could call it controversy issue, <laughs> whatever whatever name you want to put on it. Uh, it, it. I think it's interesting because it, it's popped up back in the news, and I, I want to talk about that. But can you just give us before we jump into it a little a little brief history on on pebble for somebody that maybe has never heard of it? Sure. Um... Well, I like to start talking about Pebble with just a quick intro to Bristol Bay, um, because that's really the reason so many organizations are diving in on this and concerned about the idea of Pebble. Um, So the mine, it's a it's a gold, copper and molybdenum mining proposal. Um, but it's proposed at the headwaters of um, two incredibly productive rivers in the Bristol Bay region of Alaska. Um, it's at the headwaters of the Nushigak and Quijack rivers. And the Bristol Bay region um, is often called salmon country or a salmon powerhouse. Um, it's year after year been producing record runs of wild salmon. And in return, that feeds a uh, trophy rainbow trout fishery and um, hunters and anglers from around the world love to go there to catch fish um, in addition to the commercial fishery and uh, the native populations of the region that depend on the fish there. So um, because of the type of mining that's proposed at Pebble, it has a high likelihood to pollute the water that sustain these fisheries and thus the people of Alaska. Um, so that's kind of what's at stake. It's, it's sort of this, you know, people come out and say, we're not against mining, but Mm -hmm. this is the wrong place to do it. Yep. It's, it's, and it's pretty much at a place that it sounds like it's a place that, you know, you you hear the word mitigation stuff, you know, occasionally, but it sounds like this is a place where you can't really mitigate for this because it's just, it's irreplaceable, the habitat. There's nothing like it in the world. Absolutely. You know, uh, we, what we've seen across the Pacific Northwest coast is, um, kind of dwindling stocks as you, um, Mm -hmm. go South from Alaska and Bristol Bay is this stronghold. And, um, you know, when you fly over it in a plane, you can see that it is that way because it's undeveloped and there's miles and miles of intact habitat. So if they want to keep expecting to see these strong salmon runs and amazing fisheries, um, that, that's the key component that needs to, to remain. 
that's it. That's it. And the bottom line is if we can't protect the, the, uh, the best, most productive, uh, you know, native, you know, fisheries or native resources, then yeah, then we probably don't have much left to go on. It sounds like. Um, right. So which, which species now are we talking about up here? Does it have all the species or what are the, what are the focus for, for this area? Yep. So it's got all five, uh, Pacific salmon and then, uh, rainbow trout, Arctic char, uh, Dolly Varden, grayling, and then pike and lake trout. Okay. Yeah. So it's got the, everything. And then what is, so when you think of pebble, I, you know, I remember this was a, it seems like a number of years ago now it was kind of out there. Can you talk about why it's come up again? Because it sounds, it seemed like it was, it was kind of gone. It was all taken care of and now it's Yeah. Back. Yeah, totally. So, um, the reason most people thought Pebble was dead was because in 2014, um, the Environmental Protection Agency issued what was called the Proposed Determination, which were basically protections for the region, and it limited the size of mining that could happen um, in Bristol Bay to still protect the fishery. However, because of a series of lawsuits filed by Pebble, those protections were never finalized. So they were left on the table, but they were never actually in place. So in 2017, um, a new investor that has since left, but um, Pebble got an influx of cash from this new investor and went ahead and filed its key federal uh, mining permit. Um, this is kind of like the big one, uh, Clean Water Act permit that a lot of other permits are based on. And so that um, sort of brought it back to life. So even though that investor has since walked away from the project, um, their their key permit application that they'll need to get going is um, under review um, to this day by the mm. federal government. Well, wow. and. And that's what I think the story was before is that, you know, there was the permit, but because millions of people came out and signed the petition, it basically lost support from those funders. And now, and now we're at the same spot again, where we need a lot of people to come out. Is that what we need people to do if the, to sign another petition? You know, um, we're in a tough spot right now. So last spring, there was a huge public comment period on the environmental review as part of that permit. Um, but that has since closed, and for this permitting, um, for this key permit, that's the only um, opportunity for public comment that was available. However, right now, um, we're focusing on making sure that Congress and even the White House know that we need them to step in and stop the permit process. So we're just making sure that they have seen that every step of this process, um, the permit reviewers, which is the Army Corps of Engineers, has call, kind of fallen short of um, the rigorous process that they should be undertaking to um, issue or deny the permit. Um, and because of that, it should be denied. So we're still, you know, if the public wants to get involved, uh, weighing in with their members of Congress or the White House is how they can do it. Gotcha. And, and probably in the current administration. I mean, so currently the interesting thing is right now it's February, oh, it's almost March of 2020. We're going into the, uh, you know, the potentially a new president or maybe the same president. I mean, you know, until we get to that point, um, I mean, I guess, what, what do we think when you look at the political environment, because it's so crazy, is, is it realistically, you know, do people contact the White House? Is there anything that could be done there? Or is it more talk to your local representatives? Um, it's both. So, yeah. We we have a petition on our website directly to the president, um, and what we want to make sure he knows and, and any member of Congress knows is that it's really a threat to American jobs and business. Um, mm -hmm. The commercial fishery out there is a $1.5 billion industry, and that alone provides 14,000 jobs each year, and that's not even counting the sport fishing and hunting industries and bear viewing out there is getting to be quite a large industry. Um, so really wanting to prioritize these American jobs and industry over uh, the profits of a Canadian owned company. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the data is out there that shows basically, you know, forget about the natural resources. I mean, that's obviously the most important thing here, but when you look at the economics of it, I mean, is it a no brainer that, you know, protecting it just for the economics versus uh, the other side, which is what we get some, you know, some of the mining. Is that all out there as far as the data comparison? 
It really is. And, and it seems like what we have in this permit review process is the government trying to sweep that data under the rug. So Pebble is trying to claim that they can operate this mine and we can have the fish too, but the science just does not back that up. Mm -hmm. So there's all these risks, there's unprecedented size and water management, and all of this needs to be done in perpetuity. So long after Pebble has closed its doors, they need to have a safely operating um, toxic waste management system that needs to sit atop Bristol Bay forever. And so all these factors of the water treatment they need to do and managing this project in such an ecologically sensitive area, this, the math and the science just doesn't add up there. Yep. Yep. Okay. So basically if somebody is interested in helping uh, protect this area, like you said, the best thing would be just to call, you know, send letters, White House representatives, whoever you can, maybe share it with another uh, people, you know, just to let people know that, hey, this is still a major issue. And and so how close are we to, you know, the next steps? I mean, how, how, what is the next step in this thing if it was, to, you know, to move forward? Yeah. So the Army Corps needs to release its final environmental impact statement um, that informs the decision of whether or not they'll issue this permit. Um, we've got to look at the preliminary draft of that, and we're not very impressed with what we see. So um, we're hoping they, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. improve that. Um, but currently, uh, they're on track to make a decision on this key permit um, by late this summer or this fall. Um, so if that happens, you know, they could deny it, which is great. Um, if they approve the permit, um, it goes to a state of Alaska level fight, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, there's a number of permits they'll have to get at the state level. Mm -hmm. um, but for people who don't live in Alaska, really between now and this fall is um, one of the fine, final meaningful ways they can weigh in. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's, uh, yeah, talk about, okay. the interesting thing is, is that it's final to the fall, right? The, the November election as well, right? Everything is coming. Up. This mm -hmm. is going to be a crazy year. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. And and with an issue like this that's gone on for so long, I always like to say that, you know, people I think don't realize how much their their voices or their small actions matter. So, you know, you might see these petitions online where you fill in your name and your email address um, to send a letter to Congress or signing mm -hmm. on to something. Um, those actually are really important, even though they seem you know, it takes a couple of minutes and you're like, I don't really know what yeah. this is doing, but, but being able to consistently deliver thousands of names, um, is really important to show Congress like, Hey, people are watching this and really care about it. So when you see groups like Trout Unlimited or whoever it is, um, posting stuff like that, taking a couple of minutes to do it actually does make a big difference. Gotcha. So if somebody was to say, you look at the people that are listening to this show right now, and it's probably going to be in the you know thousands, if every single one of those people took an action like you're talking about, you think that that could make a difference? That could help? It really does. Yeah. And, and especially people who, um, you know, live in districts of Congress people that are, um, influential to the president, mm -hmm. um, so you never know, you never know who's talking to who and just making sure that people know this is an issue we're tracking um, is gotcha. important. Gotcha. Yep. Let's, um, let's dig in a little bit more, uh, you know, to the, the project itself. You, you kind of know this at the start, but I mean, are there other similar projects to, to this project in the past or is this a kind of a unique thing they're, they're doing up here? Mm -hmm. So um, Alaska has, a, a long history of safe resource development. Um, but what's being proposed at Pebble is many times the size of Alaska's largest mine. Um, and the reason for that is that the, the deposit is incredibly low grade, uh, meaning that you have to, they have to unearth massive amounts of ground to get a small amount of viable uh, materials. Um, but, you know, as they, as they have to do that, that, that means more of the, um, hmm. kind of the aftermath in the mining process that they have to deal with. So that's what makes it so problematic. Plus the, the location. Right. Right. So that's the idea that there's this, the big thing here is that there's the, the tailings, right? They're, they're building this reservoir of, of the, basically the, whatever's left 
that is supposed to, I'm not even sure about that whole, the science there, but essentially the idea is that, I mean, an earthquake, right, could rupture this thing. It can take away the, all of Bristol Bay in one shot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there's there's kind of the possibility both or either of the catastrophic failure where it breaks. You know, we've seen um, examples of this um, most recently in Brazil, or there was the one in um, British Columbia called at the Mount Polly mine, um, you know, where you see billions of gallons of toxic slurry going yeah. down the river. Um, but then because pebbles... Um, tailings will have to be managed forever there's also this high likelihood of kind of the slow uh leak which um Mm. because bristol bay is currently so pristine um even those like slow leaks over time would would really add up and impact the fishery wow yeah that's crazy um what is the you know i guess again you're thinking about the pebble i mean if i've heard that Part of this thing is that they're, they've scaled it down, I think, right? Pebble has come back with another plan that said, hey, we're not doing this gigantic thing. It's smaller than the original. But but there's also the thought that they're going to eventually get their permits and then expand it later into a bigger and bigger thing. Is there anything to keep them from expanding the project if they do get their permits? No. I mean, they'll have to apply for another permit. Um, but it's it's pretty bothersome um, and, and troubling that they're going about it that way. Um, because while they're applying for this, we're calling it a phase one permit, they're telling the investment community that they're planning a multi-generational mine. So basically they're admitting Hmm. that they've applied for this fraction of what they really intend to mine because they know that the environmental impact that their full mine plan would show would be completely unacceptable and they would never get a permit. So they're saying, we're just going to show you this right now. If we get this permit, that means we'll already have the infrastructure we need to expand. We'll already have put in the roads, the power generation, the port, and it'll be much easier to keep mining from there. And the other issue with that is that Pebbles deposit is adjacent to millions of acres of additional mining claims Hmm. that right now are not economically viable. But if Pebble goes in and adds all that infrastructure, suddenly all those are more possible. Wow. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's it. So it seems like, you know, and on, you know, the same track, I guess this question, I've this has come up a few times, you know, doing the podcast here and talking about conservation issues. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you and you, I guess, work for Trout Unlimited? Maybe you could talk a little bit about um, your, your background there, but also how do you guys get the word out to people? Because it seems like people kind of don't want to hear the negative. You know what I mean? Like the conservation issues sometimes don't get as much play because people are tired of hearing of the, the negative stuff. Do you guys find that's an issue? And then how do you get the word out? Like on this Bristol Bay thing, how, how do you guys do it? How, how are you helping to get people connected? Sure. Um, okay. I think I heard There's three a few. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I gave you three right there. So <laughs> Yeah. So, so my background personally is um, I have degrees in communications and environmental science. Um, but our team at Trout Unlimited, we have – Um, a bunch of scientific and technical experts that we hire on contract to help us review Pebbles plans and stuff like that. Um, So, you know, I'm kind of always in, in coordination with our, our technical Mm -hmm. team and legal teams to make sure that we've um, actually analyzed what's being proposed and how it will impact the fishery. Um, And then uh, how we talk about the negative or kind of, we call it issue fatigue a lot mm-hmm. yep. <laughs> um, with Pebble is is mostly just focusing on how special the place is. Um, so, you know, this issue has gone on for so long and, and people are sick of hearing about it. Yep. But anytime someone goes to um, visit Bristol Bay, there's this renewed commitment and sense of like, we really can't mess this one up. Um it's, it's just an incredibly special place. I always like to talk about, um, one day I was there, uh, in the fall, like a couple seasons ago and I was visiting with some family and they're not from Alaska. So they really wanted to get, um, a bunch of salmon to take home mm-hmm. uh, for their freezer. And I wanted to catch a big trout. Um, I already had salmon and I, I just wanted some big fish and the guide was like, sure, no problem. So we headed out in the morning they got their limits of salmon within a couple hours and super happy fish for the winter. And then we ate lunch 
And by the afternoon, I had caught a 28 inch rainbow trout, wow. another over 24 inches. Um, so just this fantastic day on one river, um, you know, that, cool. that just shows like how productive the place is. Yeah. So, yeah. so we kind of always turn it back to that of like, there just aren't places like this. No. Um, many of them left. No. Yeah. No, it's, it's been interesting. It sounds like you do a little bit of fly fishing. Yeah. Oh, yep. cool. Cool. Well, obviously, yeah, this is, <laughs> this show is mostly focused around fly fishing. So, I mean, this is kind of connected as well, but yeah, I've been looking at trying to put together some trips up to Bristol Bay, you know, and, and because it's such an amazing place, right? I mean, it's known for these mousing up rainbows, probably like you're talking about and, and just mm -hmm. this amazing, I mean, you know, and the trips aren't cheap, you know, these trips up there are thousands, you know, seven, some of them, you know, even more $8,000 for a week. So, I mean, obviously, like you said, there's the economy. This is that money's going into the economy up there and and that's part of that that billions of dollars so um i think it's the maybe the stories right i mean maybe that's the cool thing i, I hope that i'm going to do my best to get the word out about this but it seems like stories are always a good way to do it is that what you guys when you look at some of the stories up there is that how you kind of paint the picture a little bit yeah lots of stories um and and we like to get out um, images and video as much as possible just you know if it's not possible to actually go visit the place um being able to see these amazing aerial images of rivers that are just red because of all the salmon that are in them. Um, mm -hmm. It's pretty powerful or there's really cool underwater footage where you can see, you know, yeah. the rainbow trout tracing the salmon, um, eating up their eggs as they go down. And um, it's pretty neat. That's a, is that at, um, is that the save Bristol Bay dot org? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Everything's there. Okay. And that's just yep. a site, a separate site. I mean, you could go to the Trout Unlimited site as well, probably get over there, but it, that's just a site just for uh, this specific project. I mean, is that how you guys set up? Do you have multiple projects you're working on now, or is this pretty much taking up all your time? No, we, the Trout Unlimited program in Alaska works on, you know, salmon and trout issues across the state. And then nationally, we have a number of uh, priority campaigns. So the SaveBristolBay.org site is really just where we kind of lay out the case for why Bristol Bay is so special and, and what is the problem with, um, with this proposal. Okay. Okay. And what about, um, you know, one thing I've heard stories about is, especially up in Canada, the, the, the power of some of the tribal, you know, communities up there and how they've been able to knock some projects similar to this, right? I think there was an OL or a LNG project or something like that. But do you, do we, do you have the same as the tribal government? Is there that power up there or the native peoples? Is that something that's still part of your process? Yeah. So we, um, work really closely uh, with the native uh, groups that have kind of banded together in Bristol Bay to come out in opposition to this. So um, there's a group called United Tribes of Bristol Bay. Um, they rec represent, I think, you know, I'll get the number wrong, but a mm -hmm. number of, of the tribes from the region. And um, we actually try to stand behind them and let them um, – lead because you know the opposition really started there and um those protections in 2014 uh, were requested by the local tribes um so you know we kind of back them up and whatever the sport fishing community can do to help out um we're always there but they're they're definitely the leaders okay yeah that's good so mm -hmm. that, that yeah so you have tied into the community and who are the other players out there when you think of people that are supporting, um, you know, what you're doing here. So you got TU, you got some of the local, um, you know, are there other groups, people involved? Is it a bunch of groups or what's that look like? Yeah, there are, um, there's a group of commercial fishermen that have banded together that to speak out. Um, so I would say it's the primary group, primary groups are tribes, commercial fishermen, and then sport fishermen. So the lodges and, okay. um, tourism industry that includes bear viewing and hunting. Um, and then there's a number of, um, conserva conservation nonprofits that have mm -hmm. kind of chimed in as well. Okay. Yeah. Cause it seems like, I mean, I'm definitely more of the optimistic person, but it seems like where we're going with this, that I could just see the ultimate nightmare of, because, you know, hoping the federal government's going to you know, and I'm I just I'm thinking more of the, the kind of in the White House that that's going to solve this problem. I'm a little skeptical about that. So I, I wonder if, you know, maybe it is really going to come down to more of the local um, piece up in Alaska. And I know that 
when you think of that, a big part of that is who are their constituents, right? Who are the people that they are basically were voted in? And it sounds like you have those people uh, kind of behind you. Is is that not the case? Uh, yeah. I mean, so the region itself, um, poll after poll shows over 80% opposes it. And oh, wow. then statewide, um, around 60% oppose the project. Mm-hmm. And for a state as friendly to resource development and mining, that's, yeah. that's a really significant number. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, ha- you know, we have done a lot with the state decision makers, um, to make sure that they know that Alaskans are really opposed to the idea. Um, and we've got our U S senators, um, Murkowski and Sullivan basically standing up to say, um, that they're watching this permit review process really closely. And after the draft environmental impact statement came out, they basically said, you know, Hey, this thing isn't up to snuff. Mm. Um, a lot of federal agencies said the same thing. So I think a lot of, a lot of, um, key decision makers at the state level are waiting to see, uh, what they're going to do to make sure that they're using the best available science to review the plans. There you go. There you go. So they're thinking, yeah. So everybody's kind of hoping for plan, plan A coming through, but maybe there'll be some other things that they can do. Pulling yeah. some strings. Okay. But that said, I mean, it's still really important for the public to hold them accountable to that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Okay. And what is the, so the mine itself, I guess it's mostly, it's copper. Is that, is that mostly what, what they're looking to get out of this? Yeah. For the most part. So yep. copper. And what is copper? What's the number one thing copper is like in the daily life it is used for? Um, Right now, it's used for a lot of electronics and um, of renewable energy infrastructure. Yeah, that's it. So, that's it. So the phone. So all the stuff we're, we're using to do this podcast is basically using some of the co- the copper. Yeah, totally. And and you know our our opposition throws that back at us all yeah. the time. And and you know they're absolutely right. And we kind of have to say like we get it. Like our society uses and needs relies on this, this material, but some places are just too special to risk by this type of mining. And Bristol Bay is one of them. That's it. That's it. Okay. So I guess just looking again, I mean, if you look back, we kind of, kind of went over a lot of this pretty quick, but anything else to know about as far as the project, you know, if somebody, again, somebody's new to this and they just listen to this, did we miss anything to give them a, a good perspective on what this is all about? So it's all about um, the last intact wild salmon and and incredible fishery in Bristol Bay. Um, It's it's a kind of a natural national treasure um, that's still remaining um, that people who go there, they're they're just breath is taken away by the beauty and how productive the place is. Uh, But when it comes to pebble, um, the issue there comes down to size type and location so those three things about the mine make it incompatible with the fishery Mm -hmm. so it's it's absolutely massive it's a type of mining that's known to harm the fishery and it's in a location at the headwaters of two of the most important rivers that if there was a spill or accident would likely cause both of those cause harm to both of those river systems um and and because of that would just decimate a lot of the fish-based industry um, in the region. Nice. Yeah, that was that's well put. I love the simplifying and just saying size, type, location. That's an easy way to to understand why this is such a critical uh, area. Mm-hmm. And we're talking, yeah, I mean, you're talking not just, it's funny when you think of the numbers of fish because down in the lower 48, you know, if you say a million fish, you know, that would be an amazing number. But up there, you're talking tens, tens of millions of salmon, right? Yeah, into last, just this last area. summer, right? Yeah, last summer, just this region had a return of 56.6 million Jeez. fish. Uh, that's just salmon. Yeah. Yep. Wow. So it's it's massive. Um, and then just, again, to, <laughs> to emphasize the size, one thing that really stuck out to me is um, – I was going over the amount of um, kind of their water management, which which is a key issue with this mine. You know, it's a, it's a wet region. Obviously, the river systems and water is incredibly important there. And Pebble um, estimates that they'll have to manage between 2 and 11 billion gallons of wastewater per year. And to put that into context, if you were to fill up the entire 80,000-seat Dallas Cowboys stadium, that's just 1 billion gallons. 
So the idea of having to manage 11 times that every year without, without any accident Uh, is, it's preposterous. How how do you, yeah, it seems. And the only comparison I think of because it's kind of closer to home for me is the, um, are you familiar with the Hamford um, nuclear, that whole thing in the upper Columbia? Just a little bit. Yeah. So it's crazy, right? It's crazy. It's the most polluted radioactive spot in the country. And it's literally next to the Columbia River, right? It's it's this, you know, it's this thing that's just up there and it's been leaching into the soil and, you know, they think maybe into the Columbia for years. Mm-hmm. And now they're mm-hmm. trying to think of ways like, what do we do with all the waste? They got these humongous tanks of, of nuclear active waste and, and they've talked about, for, you know, moving it over to Nevada. It's just crazy. It's basically we have this environmental disaster and, and nobody can, di- and it seems like we're kind of getting the same thing, right? This is the same. You've got this, this waste that is just could potentially become the same sort of thing. Exactly. Yep. And, and, you know, it, a lot of these mining companies, it's not that they all have, you know, <laughs> bad intentions, you know, but they, um, you know, they say, all mining companies in permitting say we can manage this this project and keep the water safe and yada yada. And yeah. a report came out last year that um, by Earthworks and it showed that 93% of operating mines exceed their water quality standards. 93%. Yeah. So wow. so that's just the reality. Um, there's and there are dozens exam- of examples of of these types of accidents happening all over the world and country. That's it. And I did have that note to the ninety, and I think I wrote down ninety ninety three percent failure rate in the U.S. Is that kind of what you're talking about? It must be the same thing. Yeah. So the so water quality standards are basically them agreeing to keep the certain mineral pollutants under a certain level. Um, so they're ninety three percent are exceeding those levels that they say they say they'll stay within. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I think, um, you know, if you have a second, but get, getting ready to wrap this thing up, but we do a little segment on this I call the 222. And typically it's, uh, I do a top two tips. Uh, we're talking fly fishing. So I'm saying uh, top two flies, top two tips and things like that. Do, do you, uh, would you like, like to talk a little bit about maybe your top two flies up there just for, for fun to see? I mean, have you done some, it sounds like you've done some salmon and, and rainbow fishing. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, you're on the spot. You're on the spot now. Yeah, what, what are your, cause totally. I, cause I've had, I've, I've been up there. It's been a long time, but I'm planning, like I said, another trip. And I, I always love just hearing like, what are the flies that people are using? So do you have anything come to mind? Yeah. Well, I mean, the most fun is mousing. It, yeah. You know, it's hard. You miss a lot of fish or at least I do, but it's so exciting. Um, it's like, it's such a fun, um, top water fishing and it's just like the fish rise and the excitement is so high and even if you miss it which i do all the time because i get too <laughs> exciting too excited and pull it back too quick it's just yeah. it's so well, fun what's the key to so you're mousing for somebody who's never moused before so you're doing it you know what would be a tip you would give somebody from not is that it just like let them take it or what it, can you paint that picture if you're trying to do it for somebody <laughs> I am the wrong person yeah. to do it, but yeah, just be patient and, you know, you see that fish rise, but they got to, they have to actually bite, bite it down it. if you have any chance of getting them to hand. Yeah. yeah. So, you, so you're pretty much, it's almost like, like dry fly fishing, the same sort of thing where yeah. you, yeah. you gotta, you just gotta wait and then they, they hammer it. That's amazing. So do you have, I know we've talked, actually I've had a few guests on this. I think Brian O'Keefe was talking about mousing and he, um, there's a, they, there's a bunch of patterns out there that are definitely named patterns for mousing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I was using a Moorish. That's it. Moorish mouse. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Moorish mouse. That's, that's the one. Okay, cool. Yep. That's so fun. Um, and then I guess, you know, for salmon, um, sockeye, they're, they're not really going after fish. You kind of just got to snag them as they're running up the river. But, hmm. uh, coho later in the season, um, they're fun on a fly. Um, anything bright pink, mm-hmm. uh, will attract a coho and they will jump and run like crazy. Um, so it's, it's really fun fishing and good eating. <laughs> cool. Cool. And are you up? What, what town are you in? 
I live in Anchorage. Oh yeah, you're right in the the heart of it. The, the, what they say about Anchorage, it's like if you want to if you want to uh, experience Alaska, get ten miles away from Anchorage or something like. Or what's yeah, the say? There's totally. some joke. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, you, I don't know the exact one, but you know, you get outside of Anchorage, and everyone in Alaska uh, kind of is making fun of us here. So. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I mean, Anchorage is amazing. I mean, I've been there a couple times. It, it is an amazing city. It, it's anything that you know, like Anchorage, that, that you love about it. If you had to pick one thing. Uh, the access to amazing natural places. I yeah. mean, you know, you go south and you can get on the Kenai Peninsula, fish the Kenai River within a couple hours. Um, awesome hiking. Or you can fly out um, to places like Bristol Bay. I live right by um, Lake Hood, which is the largest seaplane base in the world. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. So there's just so much potential for adventure here. Um, that's cool. It's, it's pretty special. Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah. Well, let's finish up that two two twenty two. So we and this I'm going to mix it up this time. Normally, like I said, I'm talking more fly fishing, but we we talked about um, kind of the kind of the flies there. What about like if you said the other two would be two things that that people could do if they want to have the most impact on helping this Bristol Bay, this thing we're talking about here today? Could you pick two things? What would you give them? Two two calls to action for the people today that are listening right now. Mm-hmm. I would. Um this is for any, any issue that's important to you really is, um, keep up on the latest. A lot of these conservation issues take years to sort out and you're going to find yourself kind of getting sick of them, but, yeah. you know, pick an organization that you trust that's tracking it and watch their website or get on their email list, follow their social media and just keep tabs on it. Um, and the other thing I would say is, is, um, just, keep speaking up, even if it feels like you're making zero difference or you don't know where that letter goes or you never hear back from the state senator or U.S. senator you contacted, just know that that that, that message um, has value and it's worth your time to send it. Yep. That's it. That's, that's a great, it, it is interesting because like we said, that the, the signing the petition isn't there right now, but speaking up is probably the most powerful thing, you know, we, anybody can do. Mm -hmm. Yep. We always have on our website um, an action page that we update with whatever is the most important thing you can do right now. Mm -hmm. So if you just go to savebristolbay.org and there's a take action tab, um, that's it. And when something else comes along, we'll we'll change it. And uh, yeah, keep checking back. Cool. And just finishing up again on that 222. So the final two I, I would say is talking about resources. If you had to say two resources that could help somebody learn more about maybe just, you know, kind of some of the stuff you're doing or just, you know, in general, is there any other, other than TU, who would you recommend? Or are there any good resources online that people could go take a look at or, or become a member of? Uh, well, if you want to go straight to the source of what Pebbles proposed and how they're um, looking at it, um, there's a website called pebbleprojecteis.com. Okay. Um, this is going to be all the documents Pebble has filed and exactly what the U.S. government has done to review it. However, it's it's uh, it's dense. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's technical stuff. Um, so that's kind of the role of groups like Save Bristol Bay and TU is to sort of. Um, make it a little bit yeah. easier to digest. Yeah. Um, other resources, uh, I would say <clears throat> this is kind of a random one, but to get a sense of, of what Bristol Bay is, um, mm-hmm. there's a partner we use called, uh, fly out media. Um, they, uh, have made a number of, uh, fishing fly fishing videos, oh, cool. um, in the Bristol Bay region. Mm-hmm. And, um, going through some of the videos they've produced on their website, um, people just, I mean, I can just watch them for hours. They're just so beautiful and, um, really exciting to watch. And, and it just kind of shows you like what all the fuss is about when it comes mm-hmm. to Bristol Bay. That's it. That's a great one. I love the random stuff for sure. That's that, uh, you know, the random links, the random stuff. So that's good. When you think about, you know, in fly fishing, obviously in the fly fishing space, there's tons of companies I, that always come to mind when you think of, you know, the, the Orvis, Patagonia, these great conservation companies that are leading the way what would you tell somebody that's listening to this that maybe has a company maybe a small one or whatever whatever you know medium that hasn't been a real big part of it that anything that they could do you know to kind of help as we're moving in the, this last year here yeah i mean any any businesses have a real voice in this because i think a lot of decision makers um have this 
elected decision makers have this like, you know, development and business at all cost thing. And so businesses that are existing speaking up and saying, hey, we our actual model depends on intact resources and, and that's how we thrive. Um, that's really important. So, um, you know, whether it's donating 1% of your profits or um, having information um, on your website about this or whether it's, you know, signing on to uh, letters that get delivered to the White House and Congress, um, you know, handing out no pebble mine stickers with your products or mm-hmm. there's tons of ways to Lots get involved. Idea. Yeah. But, but businesses definitely have an important voice. Yeah. Is there a good place to get some of those stickers or just kind of make them yourself or on the pebble, the no pebble mine stickers? They're available, um, on the website, say bristolbay.org. There's a drop down under donate called no pebble mine sticker. Oh, cool. Good deal. Yep. All right. Perfect. Yep. Okay. Well, in the next, uh, I guess this is, uh, uh, you know, the next six to 12 months, anything, you know, when you think about coming up here, anything you want to highlight as far as, as we're getting, you know, new things, anything to be thinking about here? Yeah. Um, so like I said earlier, the, the, that key permit will be decided by the end of the summer. Um, so, uh, being the squeaky wheel between now and then to anyone who will listen, um, in Congress at the white house, um, making sure that, that that permit is up to snuff and um, kind of just stressing that urgency to other people um, around the country who might care about this issue, Mm -hmm. Um, telling people who don't know about it, especially people who love um, fly fishing, really. Um, So just kind of spreading the word and continuing to speak up. And then, um, I don't know, a lot depends where the fight goes. Um, It depends what happens with that permit. That's right. Okay. And, and if, like we said a, a few times here, the savebristolbay.org is the best place. And also, do you have an email if somebody wanted to c- connect with you directly? Sure, absolutely. My email is J-W-E-I-S as in Sam at T-U dot org. Perfect. All right. All right, Jenny. Well, I think that's all I have. You know, we kind of, it always seems like we kind of zip through it, but I think we touched on the key points and I'll definitely uh, get the word out on my end. And yeah, I guess the call to action would be to, to, like we said, just kind of share it and let's, you know, the next, we got a year left, you know, less than a year to, mm-hmm. to build up to this. So I appreciate you, you know, what you do and for all the hard work and uh, I'll keep in touch with you. Hopefully we'll have a good thing next year. We'll check back with you and we'll have some, we can kind of celebrate, right? Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yep. And I always tell people, if you come up to Alaska to go fishing or wherever you might be, the Trout Unlimited office is right by the airport. You can look us up and definitely stop in and get some stickers. And oh, perfect. We'll, we'll update you on the project or we'll just talk about what flies to use and that kind of stuff. So that's stop awesome. in and see us. Yeah, that, that's awesome. I have a little deal I give. You know, that's a cool thing about TU is they, you guys offer a... Um, Oh, for businesses, right? A free subscription, I think, is short a time to get part of TU. And I've been utilizing that for some of the members of our, our little community here. So, yeah, I think it's a good way to get people in the door and just let them know that, you know, I mean, obviously we should all be supporting TU and all the all the great things going on. So, cool. Well, we'll check back with you and uh, and, and hope for the best this, this year. All right. Thanks so much. So there you go. If you want to find all the links and all the uh, information we covered today, go to wetflyswing.com slash 128. Please take a look at the easiest way to support the podcast and connect with one of our local events coming up, Wet Fly Swing Live. You can find this at wetflyswing.com slash members um, to reserve your spot for the next workshop, meetup, or event on the water. That's wetflyswing.com slash members to check out Wet Fly Swing Live. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up this soon. I hope to maybe see you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.